Yeah. I'm pretty relaxed today, man. Sometimes when we do the episodes, I'm either like a little bit worked up or stressed beforehand. I think like I'm a bit sleep deprived. And sometimes being sleep deprived. Why like, are you sleep deprived? Tahajud or Why are you smirking, bro? Why are you, you're always trying to imply Mashallah. something, man, when, when you say A lot that. of du'as. This is an Islamic podcast and you can't <laughs> you can't go. We've literally given the introduction and you've already into. I, look, it doesn't sound like an innuendo, but Tanzim's face is making it an innuendo. So I was, uh, I, I don't know, sometimes I just don't sleep very well, man. And then if I, like obviously Fajr time comes and I'm not someone who sleeps early. Um, so I have to go back to sleep after and like my sleep was disrupted. So yeah, I didn't have a good night's sleep, but sometimes I don't know if anyone else has this experience where it's like, it can go either way. Sometimes when you're sleep deprived, you have like that weird, disgusting, like anxious feeling all day. Like when you have that, like, I don't know, it's sort of like a tension that you have. Um, I think it's your body producing an adrenaline response because you know, there's no energy and it hasn't been, like hasn't slept, so it needs to keep you going somehow. So yeah, it triggers an adrenaline response, and that's like an awful feeling. But other days, it's like pretty chill. You feel a bit relaxed, and that's how I am today. So you're tired, but you're relaxed. Yeah, because of the adrenaline. But no, I said that. I said that it can go either shouldn't way. Technically, adrenaline mean like you're. Bro, you did not listen to me. Yeah, I didn't because I was trying to fix the audio. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was look at this boys a conversation here this is this is how half the conversation happens That's in it. actual like podcast right so That's like i'm it. talking to a guest and guest is in his flow he's like talking for like 10 minutes in that time i'm like you know anxious about the audio and the sound waves yeah, if it's yeah, like clear yeah, so i'm looking at the audio and then i lose track of the conversation and then i just catch like the last like 30 seconds this is the trigger word him, yeah yeah <laughs> i ask him the whole 10 minutes it doesn't matter just like whatever he said at the end so if he talks about his like I don't know wife or family at the end, <laughs> I'll ask like something about like <laughs> question related to that. Even though the whole ten minutes was about something to do with you know Dean and Islam and politics or bro, if you ever in any doubt, and I reckon we've done this a couple times in the thing, be like like if we zone out towards the end of the guest answer, just be like, so what is Islam? <laughs> After they're done, changing topic now. <laughs> <laughs> so why is the Ummah bad? <laughs> I legit listen to episodes and you hear that so many times. Be like, so what is, how do you explain that? That was like my question that I went to when I was like a little bit, how you going about what the guy was saying? I, I would be like, ah, oh, so yeah, what do you think are the major causes or problems for everyday Muslims? You know? And yeah. then, that and then a- you know, yeah. And then you ask that same question reworded differently. Yeah. So <laughs> like, you know, what do you think is the issue with Muslims around the world? <laughs> Bro, but then, then, then you can like add another layer of BS to it by being like, "Oh, so the uh, issues affecting Muslims in other countries are different to the ones affecting the the Muslims in the in in the Western world." Oh, that's interesting. What do you think some of the differences are in the Muslim <laughs> world and and the Western world? And then like you go into a whole breakdown of that. But yeah, over the course of what a hundred episodes, I'm sure we've had a few um, that are more sort of perceptive and. Uh, intuitive listeners would have picked up the 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 filler questions yeah when the when the screen when the when the cognitive screensaver goes on after uh, someone's giving a very long answer you have to come up with that i think it's um i think the best episodes we've done are those where we haven't had that issue and we haven't had that zone out or that kind of disconnect because the conversation has been so free-flowing yeah. Like, you know, when you're actually engaged in a conversation with someone, like, you know, when you go to work, right? Because you have a job. Um, and I think this is what happens at work. I wouldn't know. Uh, you get like, you have to ask, like you talk to him, him, like fellow employees, you make small talk. Hey, how you going? How was the weekend? And you don't always listen to the answer, right? I, I listen. Why wouldn't I listen? So that's, you, that's you listen. So you're, you're you saying don't, you that, don't wanna like, bro. So you're saying you don't want to listen to you listen to your, your, Muslim, your these you know? random employees, but you don't listen to me. Like when I'm talking yeah, because I think as Muslims we have like a, a sort of cosmic um, connection through the mind and the hearts the, and the souls. You just know three man and taqwa. <laughs> so when no, it you're, comes you're to basically like, saying you have firasa. like you can read. No, 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 no. I think yeah. it's like a two way street. It's like you know both ways, you know, and so. And then you have to like actually listen to what people are saying in normal everyday life. Subhanallah. I don't know why you're playing with the selfie stick. Is thing. that what it is? Yeah, it's a selfie stick. You put the camera. Oh, tans a, a phone camera that we've never really ever used during a podcast. I just happened to buy it. It's very phallic. 
I must say. What's phallic? What does that mean? I'll let you. I'll I'll leave you in the dark on that, guys. But yeah, I found I found a very phallic object amongst Hanzim's uh, personal items. Not Speaking gonna... of phallic, has there been a word on Wordle? Wordy? Wordle? Wordle? Yeah, bro. Everyone's yeah. doing Wordle. Yeah. So I'm every time on Twitter, it's like populating my news feed. So I don't even bother. I haven't done Wordle once. I only did it once to show my sister how to play Wordle. Mm. So I'm spreading the knowledge, alhamdulillah, but like I don't partake yeah. in it. You're you know just, what I mean? Just transmitting. I think it's idle time. Like, you know, subhanAllah, like <laughs> the deen. <laughs> As you go by the Deoband perspective. Oh man. You know, you're not meant to have fun because it's like wasting time. Yeah. And so we don't waste time in Islam. And so I don't partake in these um, activities. And plus the other flip side to why Wordle is haram, according to my um, rulings I've, I've come up with on the spot, mm. is that you know when if you get wordle in like two lines and I've seen people do that and I've they done show it off. Yeah. yeah. That's like an ego boost, right? And so nah, it's luck. It, how's it luck? It's got them. No, okay. It yeah. might be luck, but then afterwards you, you get this surge of, you know, an ego and a, an ego boost and you decide to share it on your WhatsApp chains or mm. on your Twitter. Right? And as you do that, you get a big ego boost. Wait, did mm. I say that already? Yeah. Ego boost and then sharing. Yeah. And then ego ego boost again because people are seeing it and liking it. And they're like, wow. So when that bro, happens, I can't believe this guy. Who, when this happens, it's like it's like shaitan, bro. Like this guy who pumps iron several times a week and <laughs> and, and shows off his uh, exploits. There is saying that Wordle is prohibited because <laughs> it it promotes the ego too much. That's it. And Islam, you know, it prohibits that. So we take the, there's this passage in the Bible. I remember from when I went to Catholic studies when I was seven. Um, my parents wanted me to go to a Catholic school, so they sent me to Catholic studies. That was the only religious education I had, and there was a quote. Take the speck out of your no. Take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. So maybe what the log be in an eye? It was pretty random, right? A log, like a, a log tree log in the eye. Yeah. So a whole tree logs in the <laughs> eye. In the guy's eye. Yeah. <laughs> That's a lot to take out. So yeah, I'd be pretty preoccupied. Yeah. That. <laughs> well, you're not because you're you're going off at people for playing Wordle. And, oh, that's and the true, ego yeah. of Wordle. No, nah, Wordle is, is, is a lot of it is, is for, I think there is skill. I think if you're very skillful, you'll get it within three every time. But other than that, I think that like getting it second time is just pure, like Allah has given you that, that victory. <laughs> you know, that, that's Allah just, that's just that. comes from Allah's Because there's no way, there's 26 letters in English. Bro, how many characters are there in Bangla? It's like 50 something, right? I don't know. I think it's like you 56 know, you know characters in Bangla. The white imagine, man knows imagine, better than the Bengali bang, himself. Bangla Wordle. Bangla Wordle. Because you've got to guess like a five letter. I think it's the Urdu Wordle. I've seen that. Urdu has like, uh, apparently Urdu um, is like quite a simple language. Yeah, not, to Bangla. not surprised. Bangla is like the, the old uh, alphabet. It's really yeah, hard. Bangla elite. Bangla's elite. Did you ever try to learn to read Bangla? Nah, but it was a very cultural thing. Um, at times you see a lot of Bengali parents, like especially when the kids are younger. Some of them would go into like Bangla school. So like when I was yeah. growing up, it was like a big thing. Like, oh yeah, put your kids into Bangla school, this, that. And at the time I used to be like pretty against it. My parents as well. It's like, you know, we're in Australia. Why are you like that hyper fixation on, on Bangla? Because it takes away your weekend and, you know, there's other stuff you can sort of do. Like, you know, go to go to pre-uni to educate yourself to get into that selective school. So I was like, yeah, like from that perspective, it makes sense. But then, you know, growing up, then you're just like, oh, you sort of lose, you know, touch of your culture and your sort of your identity if you don't know the language. So... I guess like I can speak Bangla, but it's like, yeah, there's that language element if you can read it. I think there's so much, you know, Bangla and Bangladesh has a huge history with poetry, mm. um, you know, literary geniuses um, in, who are Bangladeshi. And so not being able to, you know, it's like, it's like when you access um, poetry or deep poetry, it's like philosophy. It's like you're unpacking mm. a lot of things or history or how history is articulated through the native people, right? You'll get you know, more in tune with that, right? And so I think there's a lot to, you know, you, you miss out a lot if you don't know your sort of heritage in that aspect, especially as a Bengali, not knowing Bangla. So yeah, it's a, it's a tragic, tragic case for, for me. No, it's, it's interesting. I know a lot of, uh, like, I, it's one of the most common questions I ask diaspora kids, like, oh, can you read Bangla? And um, what's been the common answer? Most people can't. Yeah. But the ones that do, I find like their speaking isn't any better than the kids who can't read Bangla. Do you know what I yeah. mean? But so this is a good point. So like speaking in of itself, I think that's like, because we, we're living in the West, um, it's been like a more Western phenomenon. We have to, you know, that hyper fixation being really good with communication. Yeah. Because essentially I think 
like taking it from a spiritual lens, from, you know, I don't know, metaphysical lens. It's like as a human being, you have to ponder, consider, think, contemplate, right? Mm. And that requires not just like conversation, even though through conversation you learn and you have teachers, et cetera, right? But just from the angle of just like, you know, pondering about the world around you, right? That requires just thinking and being in your own and being in your space and mind, right? And so when it comes to like, Actually speaking, I think that's like a different skill. That's just kind of um, almost like a capitalist society, right? Because I know um, Sheikh Salah Dasi talked about this in his episode where um, the episode that we did with him where I think you'll see a lot of white people that are doing like Arabic um, classes or courses in in, uh, in university. They're doing it from the perspective Which I of- did. <laughs> no, I did. Uh, I was a white guy who did Arabic <laughs> class in university. So Sheikh Saleh is uh, having a DAU, subhanAllah. Maybe I should let him know he's... Uh, he's I'm, I'm sure there are many digs that... that he could no, but he's just saying um, in his, I think, course. We literally bagged your bundies like like that's two true. minutes ago about the whole fun fatwa. So oh, yeah, that's true. That's another thing. I got a couple strikes against me. Yeah, and he, he, he said that a lot of them want to be, you know, like um, working overseas in, uh, you know, like, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, like government positions overseas and all that. Yeah, and yeah. To know Arabic and to go to the Middle Everyone East. Everyone was like, I'm going to be a diplomat. Everyone in that yeah, class. I'm like, there aren't that many right? diplomat That's jobs the word available. Diplomat. Sorry, just had a brain fade. I started mm. to say governments and other countries. Ah, and nah, this I and got that. you. But anyway, so, yeah. So from that angle, it's like, that's why, you know, speaking has been mm. really, you know, there's a hyper fixation in terms of, you know, making an income at the end of the day. Whereas, you know, back in, in our times and that sort of thing, it's like, it's more about reading writing, yeah. articulating. And so I think Sheikh Salah Basir also said like when it comes to, um, for example, like from Indian and the subcontinent, they were like masters of Arabic, but they weren't like good speakers of mm. Arabic. I remember him so, saying that. Yeah, it's quite common. Um, I actually it makes sense because like conversating anyway is like a level down almost because like the sort of richness of the Arabic. Um, I think ri- once you ri- learn the actual master, the grammatical sort yeah. of structure, Sarf and Nahu, once you master those, it shouldn't be that mufradat is is vocabulary, isn't it? Yeah, but once you have that um, vocabulary aspect, that like th- that can be added later. Yeah. But I think that if you just learn to speak colloquially or speak to people, it's very difficult to then try and climb. You, you're basically starting from scratch almost when it comes to assailing the great mountains of of grammar and 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 the structure of the language, as opposed to learning that structure. Like, as I said, uh, one of my uh, Arabic teachers was Pakistani and he didn't speak conversational Arabic. Yeah. But obviously when we were reading a text in Fusha or anything, he would understand the whole text and he would be able to translate it for me, which showed that he had the necessary skills in the language yeah. for like his Islamic sort of, um, his Islamic orientation. But there's a high level of diglossia in Arabic and, and also in Bangla. So diglossia is a difference between the um, formal register of a language and the colloquial register yeah. of a language. So in English, we don't really have that. So it's hard for us to imagine, but obviously we can imagine it in terms of Arabic more maybe, or Bangla, you know, like Shudda Bangla. And then, yeah. but I think it's the actual technical word is like Cholito Bangla or something like that. So the formal Bangla, like I've played Nabila, um, my wife, some poetry in Bangla. Um, and, we're talking like 100, 200 year old poetry and she can't understand it. She's like, it's completely different. Yeah. Like maybe Ami is the only word she can, she's like, <laughs> I'm like, oh, did you get that? She's like, yeah, Ami, I, I got that. Um, and Arabic's the same. Like the difference between Fusha and like how the Lebanese people around here speak yeah, it's is completely, completely different. different. Yeah. You know, even like, Gefaha Luki, Gefaha Luka. Yeah. So I would say it to like my um, a coworker because he's like Lebanese. He's like, yeah. he's like already automatic reaction is like, whoa, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whoa, chill bro. <laughs> Can you imagine going in and just speaking like Shakespeare in English yeah, at the corner yeah. shop? If you're like, good evening, kind sir. I request of you uh, the finest selection of your... That's what it's like to speak Fusha. Like it, it, people would be like, oh. yeah, taken aback by yeah. it. Yeah, that, what do they say? They, shoo, just shoo. Like it's just this one sentence. Yeah. Instead of like, halik, it's like, it's like shoo. And um, yeah, so the, the, the glossia is really makes it complex. But I think that once you learn, because you know why we study Shakespeare at school? I had this debate with my brother-in-law recently. Why we study Shakespeare at school? Because he's like, I don't see the point of it. It's not relevant to me, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, bro, 
everything you are is derived from language. All of your thoughts, all of your ideas, every process that you go through as a human subconsciously is done in the English language. Yeah. So the sophistication of your thoughts is limited to or restricted by the amount of English words that you have, because that's the medium through which you think. If you don't have any words, you you don't have any thoughts. Yeah. But if you have to think in in terms of a language, so Shakespeare is sort of definite. Hume has something to say, which I'll add. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just remind no, no. me to talk about um, that. But yeah, go on. Definitely is like a really complex. It's a really like sort of important conversation. I really enjoy it. The language and philosophy language, side of it. Thoughts. So Shakespeare is basically one of the most influential, if not the most influential, um, writer in the English language. And he actually defined the course of the English language, more or less. Yeah. Yep. So when you have someone... But isn't there theories where there was like, is Shakespeare a person who made too many plays? <laughs> yeah, so but... So was there multiple... Whoever, whoever this guy is... <laughs> whoever this guy is, yeah. Yeah. Like, or, or guys. Or yeah, yeah, these guys or males. Are, I've even heard like conspiracy theories that his name was Sheikh Zubair. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was a secret Muslim. No, no Englishman, no Kafir yeah, Englishman. Also, why would he bring the Moorish That's Moors it. into... No, no Kafir Englishman could write this well is what they... <laughs> <laughs> people has to come back to yeah, Islam, yeah. influenced by Islam. So no, so that like he's definitive in the English language. So basically, Shakespeare is inside your brain, is what I said to him. He's in your mind. He makes your thoughts. If you understand Shakespeare, you understand a lot of the English language. And so, if you understand the English language, then your thoughts will advance naturally as your command or grasp of a particular language improves. Um, so. That's why you have to start. I think that's why literature is most important because we, we actually like segued into that discussion. But before that, what um, oh, yeah. what so did you want to mention? David Hume. So David Hume talks about <laughs> essentially if our thoughts are shaped by the material world. So for example, you think in blue, white, red, green, and you picture that in your head because you, when you look at the world, you you dream, uh, you, you you know, you you dream, you dream in that. So, like for example, you look around and look at the world, right? And you dream in in that world. It's not like you dream something outside of it, right? Unless you're like in space. But even that space is defined by mm. what you know of space to be, right? So the, essentially, like his point is like even thoughts in of itself, like we think in words, like we think in you know, I don't know, microphone and table. Those are the thoughts that go into our head. So like. Even language itself is shaped is, sh- is shaping our, our thoughts and our imagination and how we think um, in our brains, right? Does that make sense? But he d- does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like he justifies, however, he 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 sort of makes the the um, argumentation of um like basically all there is to the world is like the material and you're shaped by the material. Um, and I think I so I remember in class when I did classes with Dr. Samir on um, Ghazali's um, Deliverance from, from Error. And I actually asked him about this. I actually got some of the notes. I forgot his response, but he, he gave a good refutation to it. Like I remember on the day, mm. I'm like, whoa. And then I completely forgot it was like two years ago. But I got in my notes somewhere, so I might pull it up. Yeah, actually, try, but, try and uh, dig it up, man. That's but, interesting. But I bec- know like, it makes sense to a degree and it is true to a degree, but then it goes into that kind of material kind of argumentation to justify that. Because that's essentially what he was. He leaned towards like, um, David he leaned towards like atheism and um, yeah. that kind of um, argumentation. But to be fair, you know what's interesting because I've I don't know if this is exactly Yasin Morsi's point, but there's that whole idea of people saying like you know Western philosophy is like you know kufr and you know godless and these philosophers are mm. um, you know thinking everything anti-Islam. But what was really interesting is like the more you actually engage with. Um, their works and you look into their thoughts they were grappling with the concept of god like they were grappling with it to a degree and if anything it 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 shows like how much they're thinking about god in that sense right so it's something to like consider i guess i guess some i don't know why i'm going to this tangent but sometimes it's something to consider because like as muslims sometimes you know we go you know stuck for local for what's all this nonsense yada yada but essentially there's that different perspective to it where it's like that's all they were thinking about. And that's all they were, you know, engaging with and making sense of it. And a lot of like, I guess, it, not a lot, but like, I think David Hume was making the argumentation. It was very Ashari um, perspective in the sense that, you know, how can he only attribute um, God as good in that sense? Like, you know, in the sense that 
why are you defining what you perceive to be good onto God and he should be acting in, in that manner? And so like there's that argument because it's not like we can just be like his, you know, Allah is all good because essentially he also created evil, right? Allah created good and evil, right? So it's not like, like obviously we think good of God and throughout the Quran we attribute everything that is good to Allah but in a very like philosophical kind of level of understanding, you know, when Allah created everything, right? So I guess there's that Christian aspect that, you know, we we refute through the Islamic perspective in terms of, you know, we don't we're not the Mutazila in that sense, right? And how they perceived you know, they, evil yeah, and good. They limited like, they limited God to their conceptions of good and evil. There's a really interesting idea though, and I I mean it's very controversial. I don't know how much I should really go into There's it. There's so many things um, I wish I could talk about that are controversial, but sometimes I hold back. But you let it go, brother. You 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 one of us has to that, be like the ocean of controversy and it's not like good cop world. bad cop it's like good muslim bad muslim is that what you're saying like <laughs> 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 no so it's very interesting and I, I need to find some better references for this yeah um amongst some sufis a positive perspective of iblis's refusal developed arguing that iblis was forced to decide between god's command and his will accordingly Iblis refused to bow to Adam because he was devoted to God alone and refused to bow to anyone else. Thus, Iblis would have followed the true will of God by disobeying his command. Um, and I think Ooh, the brother, is... the brother of Al Ghazali, says that uh, Ahmad Ghazali that Iblis was a paragon of lovers in self-sacrifice for refusing to bow down to Adam out of pure devotion. His student, Sheikh Adi Adi bin Al Musafir. Um, was among the Sunni Muslim mystics who defended Iblis, asserted that evil was also God's creation. So this is my this is the segue that you said how God created good and evil. Well, some of the Sufis take it to this extent where they're like, they argue that if evil existed without the will of Allah, then Allah doesn't have power over something, and we yeah. know that Allah has power over all things. Yep. So what what is evil then? Think about that. If evil is is only by our perception, then is it real? Mm. Yeah, this this is the 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 question, and I think essentially, like I mean, you, I, you I, can describe I a lot to be yeah. al wadud in mm. in that sense, but in the in the in the sense of like what you perceive to be good, I think is is different in that sense, right? Yeah, it's absolutely. So then that sparks the great discussion that we have in, in our tradition, I guess, about good and evil itself. Um, and that that's also like, I think for me, that's what through the spanner and the works of the Maitesali sort of di dichotomies and discussions, because how, how can they even begin to define evil? You know? Because we're tied down. But wouldn't the argumentation, uh, you know, for example, there's that, uh, the akal versus the nakal, mm. like sort of interpretation. Mm. Can't aren't you giving weight to um, the nakal um, argument because you're tied down to your own kind of perception and rationale? And if you, was aren't you sort of? Yeah, so the, I'm, I'd definitely lean towards more the akal. The akal the, can't uh, define. But but then again, you right say the akal and nakal technically won't contradict anyway. No, in they won't. Sense, but Fakhruddin Al Razi mentions that they can't contradict. But I know that there's a slight difference between the Asha'ira and the and the Maturidiya on this. A slight difference um, when it comes to what the Aql can perceive in terms of good and evil. They've sort of come closer together in the last few hundred years, especially the early Maturidis. Um, the Hanafis, they, they came more from the perspective that the Aql could do more. They were sort of not, I don't want to use the Maitazili as like to, to imply that the Hanafis were... Um, sort of more akin to the Mu'atazili. But if you think of a spectrum, you had the Asha'ira and then you have the Mu'atazilis. The Maturidiyah are on the Mu'atazili side of that spectrum compared to yeah. the Asharis. They certainly did give more weight to the Akul in defining things. That's why they, they, they've they established that a Kafir should be able to discern Tawheed through his Akul. Whereas the Asha'ira tend not to this is for people who never got the message yeah. tend not to have that expectation yeah, yeah there's that so I, there's a difference there so the uncle like in islam there, there's a room for that debate about whether the uncle or knuckle can which uh dictates 
our understanding of good and evil. But then beyond that, it's like 4D chess is the Sufi. So we're like, is evil even a thing anyway? <laughs> Isn't everything good? Are you saying that, are you saying that um, shaitan acts without God's will? How can, you know, how can you say that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must have ordained it and must have written yeah. for that to happen. I think on a more um, like practical level, on a day-to-day -day level, um, just kind of touching on the good and evil um, aspect, I think even for me, when it comes to this, it's always going to go back to poor temperaments, right? Mm. But I think it's very necessary. And this is actually, I actually want to have another conversation on top of this, it might relate. But essentially, when it comes to like four temperaments, before you know, sort of learned about the four temperaments, you know, you look at someone that's angry or, you know, pissed and annoyed or, you know, it's like, what's even, like, what's wrong with him? Like, yeah, they're a bad, bad person. Right? Like, they're, they're not yeah. chill. Yeah, they're not chill. Like, why? So, like, there's that kind of quick, you know, characterization on that front. But then after learning four temperaments, et cetera, you know, delving into that kind of um, field of study, essentially you realize there's more to it than meets the eye, right? Um, to a person's nature, not only that, but induced by stress as a result of, like, anger you know coming out in that in certain context so it's all like always about seeing what's underneath the surface and rather than going off purely what's off um, on the surface right um and even in that like some people when they see or feel anger or um, receive anger from someone it 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 affects them a lot more compared to someone else who might be a bit more on the fiery end receiving anger right they don't really see it in the way that the other person does so this kind of opened up my eyes to that sort of, you know, even that those um, questions that I had when it comes to, you know, good and evil and all that. It's like it completely like, you know, really yeah. made things. I remember you sharing a thought with me in the past, actually, that it, that actually I found quite profound. And when you talked about the different natures of, of individuals and the different temperaments of individuals, how um, we often as Muslims sort of question the fact that, oh, like how can this non-Muslim really go to hell they're such a nice oh, guy. Yeah, bro. This Do you is actually, you I wanted, this? You know, yeah, you know the one I just said, I want to yeah. say something to, this is exactly this what is, you This yeah. is what you told me, yeah. I remember. And that actually changed my perspective um, on things. And then I started to realize like, yeah, the idea of a nice person or a good person is often just like the temperamental, yeah. um, the temperamental characteristics of like the people oriented uh, yeah. temperaments, you know? They just they just naturally are going to be that way. Because they're naturally yeah, because they naturally um have the emotional intelligence. Exactly. So why wouldn't they be good? Like exactly. in that in from the perspective of, you know, oh they're nice and Yeah, but the, the yeah, and then the like, point what is, did they do out of their own self in order to achieve that goodness? Exactly. They didn't they just just got it. But like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects certain things from everyone. And so obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the person that way, right? Yeah. You know what's truly an example of good character though is when you see someone of not not necessarily predisposed to being emotionally intelligent, who then works to become that, right? Puts in the hard yards, you know, practices, uh, you know, through self-discipline, through dhikr, to actually become that more emotionally yeah. intelligent, selfless person who wasn't naturally that way. Exactly. That is a good person. That is someone who has, who has overridden their vices or maybe overridden that. Yeah, overridden and the nafs. Even with, um, so I was looking into, uh, I'm a big, um, one of my, my heroes in terms of scholarship is um, uh, Mujaddid Shah Waliullah mm. of, of um, Dili. And um, it's really fascinating that when it comes to four temperaments, he actually, because he has his own kind of psychological um, aspect of um, the, the human and the soul. And then he actually classified the temperaments as part of the nafs, like the lower nafs, if I can mm. remember, I forgot the exact wording. Um, so he had like four kind of characterizations and he, he actually specifically put like temperamental kind of, you know, nature mm. of someone in the, in the sort of um, category. So like, it's like a part of the nafs in that sense. Um, and essentially it goes to show it's like, as you just articulate, it's about overriding that because in, in the context of being, let's just say, you know, someone that's social, um, extroverted, when they need to be principled, they need to like get things done or need to be contemplating things about it, things um, you know, a lot deeper. That's gonna be naturally a challenge for them, right? And so for them, that's what you achieve, like, wow, this guy's balanced, right? Um, if they're able to do that. But why are they suddenly in our heads, we're just like we look at that person, we're like, if they're non-Muslim, he's such a good guy. Mm. Why would he go to hell? Mm. But it's like there's more to reality than meets the eye. Yeah. Right. Because it might be because of their, their sanguineous nature, the social settings they're in, the people they're around. They just go with the vibe. 
with the yeah. flow, the thoughts and feelings of people. They, they can be generous. They can be. They yeah. can be like very. But they um, don't engaging. contemplate about the world around us. Or, yeah, or, or they tr- they don't have principles. They they they're not um they're not in dhikr. Uh, like I think that that for so why are we talking about that exactly why why are you just basing because oh they're just nice to people and oh, likewise, he's such a good guy likewise when when we see someone who's like hot headed or like aggro or like flies off the handle and he's not very easy to work with he's a bit abrasive or she's a bit abrasive like you get those characters right talking about the uh, the infamous uh, safrawi when when you see someone of that fire like that firebrand we often just say they write them off as bad people yeah. Exactly. But you know, like the thing is, would you have written Amr ibn al-Khattab off as a bad person? And, and, and so even with um, Omar ibn Khattab, عنه, um, before he became Muslim, Rasulullah some actually made dua, um, oh Allah, choose between um, who's beloved yeah. to you from Omar anhu and Abu Jahl. Yeah. And uh, Omar anhu were converted, right? So that goes to show like Rasulullah some saw the qualities in the sense of what mm. would do well for Islam. So or else why would he be making that dua? Yeah. Right, and I think there's a lot of wisdom. And even later on, um, one of the Sahaba said, like after Omar Adi who converted, like there was Izza in the Deen in the sense that because prior to his conversion, they were like getting persecuted in Mecca. Post like Omar Adi Anhu's conversion, mm. it was very close to the time where they, you know, emigrated to Medina, create that state. So Muslims had that sort of power of their own. Rather, they weren't weak. And what's fascinating is that Omar Adi Anhu, like when he um did emigration um to Medina, everyone was doing it secretly at the night, you know, hiding and. Um, you know, like, not nothing wrong with that. That's like a natural mm. thing to do because they're in persecutor, right? Yeah, when you're in yeah, danger. Yeah, and you, like, you yeah, hide, people yeah. are gonna um, stop you, so you don't, you know, want to do it sneakily, right? But he just went like, uh, like probably like at dawn, like in the middle of the day, just like strutted along to to Medina, like walked out of the city. This is that strong character, no yeah. one's gonna back him. And obviously, we know through his um the Khilafah, he spread like Islam to the you know regions far and wide. Yeah. So like, sorry, I don't know where I was going. Oh, no, hot headed. No, so like, yeah. so it's like. Obviously, Rasulullah some had that kind of, um, you know, um, foreshadowing that in that instance, right? And hence why, you know, that dua. Because he saw the qualities, obviously, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In order for one of the two, Abu Jahal or um, Umar al to be able to achieve that. And so we don't just judge on the face that like, oh, look, Umar al is angry. He was doing this, this, this prior to conversion. But there's more to it that meets the eye, right? Um, and so that's like how we have to see it in the holistic picture, right? Um, but just to add to another point about when it comes to temperaments, right? And Allah um, allowing someone to have a certain temperament. There's actually examples. Um, once, I guess, people look into the seerah, you know, properly and inshallah studying it and already have that knowledge of the four temperaments, you'll uncover so many gems, subhanAllah, mm-hmm. about psychology, human behavior. Um, because like, for example, I think I, I talked to you about this um, outside of, of um, you know, our recordings and podcasts when we driving you to, <laughs> driving you home um mm. after cricket like i'd mentioned how um essentially it's like the same questions people would come to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam for so like different people will come to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the same question but rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would give different answers to the mm. same questions from different people why is that right that's a it's a fair question obviously it's the answers are tailored towards the person himself right mm. So like, why would he you know something to the effect of like, you know, um, or Rasulullah says, I'm like, um, tell me what I should follow. What should I do? What should I do better? Or like, tell me about Islam. Like, you know, there's, there's, there's variations of it. It's like, one's like, don't be angry. Don't be angry. Or mm. one of them could be like, you know, be good to your parents or, you know, engage with prayer. Or, you know what I mean? It's like different answers for the same question. So like, um, but however, I don't know where I was going with that, but the, the one hadith actually wanted to mention, right? Um, is that the, this was um, post- if I recall, Battle of Tabuk, yeah, post uh, during when all the um, different tribes were coming and um, pretty much you know giving their allegiance to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, Islam was spreading far and wide just before the conquest of Mecca, right? So the people from Yemen came, right? And we know the many hadith of you know how blessed people of Yemen um, are, and you know the in- intelligence and intellect and and iman etc. So um, there was a man I forgot his, the tribe's name. But um, the man is Al Ashaj, yeah. And um, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi said to Ashaj, "Oh Ashaj, you have two characteristics that Allah likes: forbearance and farsightedness." Uh, he, uh, so Ashaj, said, "O oh, Messenger of Allah, was I born with them or are they acquired?" 
Rasulullah Sallallahu said, no, whether it is something, oh, sorry, no, rather it is something that you're born with. Um, and so in the actual, um, I think hadith, there's other variations. It's like later on, um, a shaj says like, praise be to Allah who's gifted me with those qualities that he is, he himself is pleased with. Mm. Does that make sense? So when it comes to forbearance and farsightedness, meaning you can sort of see that forbearance mean like patience, and you know, far sightedness being like depth and thinking about things, you can see that's more. It seems to be like yeah. a very phlegmatic or melancholic um, temperament, right? And we actually talked about this as a lot to like the Yemeni people in that sense, right? Mm. Um, in that in that context and at that time, so you see a clear kind of um, you know, like reading of the four temperaments in this context, right? That yeah. Allah has gifted people with qualities like they're born with. And henceforth, like when we come to the conversation around um, theological con- uh, conversations about why do non-Muslims go to hell, right? And something I think everyone has questioned and asked about and thought about because it's like, oh, that I don't know, like um, Mother Teresa is a nice guy, a nice, yeah. nice, <laughs> nice guy, N- a nice lady. But that's actually not true. Like she nice did girl. a lot of um, dodgy things. I but don't that's think besides that, yeah. the point. That's going to derail us to another conversation. But um, you can see clearly like it's more to it than meets the eye. And a fixation really. should be on at least the basic akal level, like acknowledge Allah's existence that we don't, you know, have Allah doesn't have any partners. You know, mm. we only worship Allah. Um, and then, you know, when we have that sort of sincerity in order to worship Allah, then, you know, Inshallah, like Allah guides that a non-Muslim to you know to Islam in the sense of you know following the Sharia and following Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and the Quran, Sunnah, etc. So that's how we should view it as normal, right? Mm. Not just oh, but he's a nice guy. Yeah. Why no. are you going to hell? There's another um, layer. D- 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 sorry, and we'll just add quickly. There's actually a hadith about this. It's like um, if uh, when when I think Muslims start to ask about. Uh, what will happen to the children of disbelievers? Like that's like, like a grave thing that Rasulullah mm. warned us about. It's like if you you know sort of just all all you think about is that, like that's a problem. The children of yeah, the children of the the disbelievers. Because it's like, what benefit does it bring you? Like yeah, just think absolutely. it like, what benefit do you get out of it? At the end of the day, you've been guided to Islam. You know, you're following Quran and Sunnah, following Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You have that kind of. This is very Jordan Peterson. It's like personal responsibility, right? But you you have your yeah, own yeah, sort you of do. will. Right? How can you? Why are you like partaking these kind of like? W- what benefit does it bring you? You do. You do have your own personal responsibility, and that's what you have to be focused on. You, you will be judged according. And I always say this to people at the end of the day when it comes to the way that they react. Like, if I call out someone's behavior, um, or even if someone calls out my own, the instinct is is generally to point out the fact that I reacted to a, a, a transgression against me that someone has done. You know, someone abuses me. I'll I'll say. Hey, well, you know, I responded that way. I'll get angry, right? And then I'll say, oh, yeah, but I responded that way because they said this to me. I only did this because of someone said this to me. Yeah. But you're not judged on Yom al based on what people said to you. You only have control. You can't control what other people will do. You can't. You can only control yourself. And because you can only control your own actions and your own reactions, that is what becomes the criterion for our salvation or lack thereof. So when you have this orientation on other people's actions and other people's fates and other people's desires and other people's thoughts and the harm done unto you by others, that is indicative of a bad state and ultimately a lack of uh, awareness of Allah. Because if you have that, that state of awareness, then you're going to be remembering that whenever anyone treats you a certain way, or whenever harm has been done to you, you know that you are responsible for your own actions. Mm. And you cannot blame someone else or or use someone else's actions or behavior to justify your own. Yeah. Because you know the way. Truth has been yeah. made clear from error. Allah. The the moral choice and the right choice is only yours and yours alone. And, and just I, sorry, yeah, go on. And and I was gonna say when it came back to the morality thing, I've been sitting on this this hadith now for some time. Mashallah, um, the forbearance, brother. No, it was, it was it was back to the idea of another layer beyond the morality conversation we were having about how oh, there's a good non-Muslim guy, you know, he's a nice bloke. Why is he going to Jahannam? You know, he seems yeah. like a good guy. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had a good chat with him, and he he always takes my bins out. That's always the stuff they ask. They be like, 
my neighbor's a really nice he's guy. He's charity. He's a Christian. He volunteers. You know, even with that, it's like just a reminder that Allah said, even with the disbelievers who do good, they get the rewards in the hereafter. Mm. And we know even like that famous, sorry, I'm mm. hijacking, but just sad quickly. Mm. Uh, I swear I'll, I'll, I'll have you the, let you the spotlight. But like even Rasulullah some said when um, there was that situation where people thought he divorced his wives and he was in, his, uh, in the mm. compartment of the masjid and Omar Radian who came and saw him and consoling and they were having a conversation. And then it, Omar Radian who said like, you know, there's um, Kisra and, you know, the Caesar that have these like, you know, palaces and jewels and you're the messenger of Allah or some and you're like sitting on a mat that's like, you know, not, mm. you know, working or whatever. Not working. Not working. But, <laughs> but it's like nothing. He's on literally got link. nothing, right? He's on he's on blanket that's not working, yeah. right? <laughs> um, even, but even at that time, it's like they were so, subhanAllah, the Ummah and the Medina state was so rich then, but still Rasul was mm. living like, um, you know, uh, very poor, but anyways, it's like you 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 have nothing, and then um, long story short, Rasulullah also some articulate like they get everything in this world, and aren't you pleased that you know we'll get our reward in the hereafter? Subhanallah. Mm. So sorry, I just wanted to add that in, but go on with your sorry about that. I think I a layer to, to a layer to the morality discussion we were having previously, and the idea of you know what I mentioned of the the quote unquote good moral kafir which is an oxymoron, a deliberate oxymoron, <laughs> the moral kafir. Um, the interesting hadith for me when, it, when, I, when I come to think about morality is uh, one that Abu Huraira reported. It's in Sahih al-Bukhari. Verily, no one will enter paradise but a soul submissive to Allah, yet Allah may support this religion by the hands of a wicked man. Have you heard that hadith? Yeah. And... What implications do you feel it has for our conceptions of morality and our conceptions of um, good? It's a good question. What do you think? Well, it's it, it's it's very profound, yeah. and it's not talked about very often. The overall net benefit to the world and the reason, the hikma behind certain individuals being in positions that they are. Often, how many times have we seen people? who have wealth of knowledge and to have these platforms and have contributed immensely to um, the deen in terms of their output. But we find out at some point, uh, often down the track, that they lived very sort of corrupt lives in terms of their personal life or they, they've been proved to have, you know, um, been infamous philanderers and and uh, some somewhat... Uh, Immoral at times, behaving immorally yeah. and unislamically in their private lives. But hopefully, no podcasters. They've but. done. Oh man, <laughs> they, like we, we're, we're the most prodigious uh, philanderers, aren't we? The the, the <laughs> male twenty under twenty five under thirty Muslim podcasters. Um, but no, the the idea that we have those individuals who are on platforms, and we always say like, why? Why? I always wondered about it. it's like, why did Allah Subhanahu wa Taala put them there? They're clearly not right for it. Surely Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would elevate someone good. Yeah. And and then you see people walking around who are so much better than a lot of the people we have on platforms. Of course. And then even in this in, in, in our context as well, we have different sects and different movements like the like the hardcore Salafi movement. You wonder like why do they have so much traction? Like why why has Allah allowed that to, to continue? You know, like we that's coming from my perspective. And I'm not saying that all Salafis are like that, of course, but some of the extreme ones, it's like why are they allowed to exist? Yeah. You know, they're clearly on a different uh, on a different path when it comes up to to things, <laughs> bless the najd, bless the najd, guys. Um, the the reality is that we can't decipher for ourselves because of this hadith proves to us we cannot decipher for ourselves what is ultimately beneficial. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's hikmah uh, is greater than our own, and we should never question that. When you see someone on a platform and you wonder like why they deserve it or why they're there or, or how someone has managed to achieve so much when they when they seem to, in reality, they, their character seems so kind of uh, dubious at best. Remember that hadith because the implications of it are that someone who may, we may perceive to be bad may be doing a great deal of good. Yeah. And that's the inverse of what we discussed previously regarding the person who may ostensibly be good but is in the eyes of Allah and in relative to the deen quite bad it's not a simple thing is it yeah the fact that hadith exists 
also throws a spanner in the works of um, the the simple binary um, and the simple dichotomy between the good Muslims and the bad non-Muslims, doesn't it? Yeah. Because it's saying that a wicked man, a bad man, could be brought in to do good for us, for the sake of the deen. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Yeah. I don't know what else to add to that. That was pretty good, yeah. Good stuff. I think um, as well, um, before we were talking about how people, we're, we're using our own perception and idea of what it means to be good and evil and projecting that and then deciding, um, you know, having doubts in our kind of Islamic theology in the sense of like, why are they going to hell or whatever, right? It's also one thing to factor in and uh, acknowledge is that we know, uh, you know, Allah's mighty names and Allah is like, you know, all just, right? So if Allah is all just, right? Then we, uh, then that implies like, He'll do whatever, you know, Allah will do things in a way that is just, right? Mm. So who are you? Like, if you're sort of deciding that on your own, you're sort of almost playing God, stuff for Allah, in that sense that you've yeah, decided you what's just and what's not. It's and deciding things like, in many ways, yeah. isn't it? Because you're, you're projecting, again, it's what we talked about before with projecting our own morality. We have an idea of justice that we've deciphered in our context. And it's like when, when the uh, divine justice doesn't seem to... Uh, be congruent with our perception of justice. We're like, oh, well, you know, how can Allah do this? And it's like, how ridiculous is that? You know, it's all, it, it, it's exactly the same thing. It's moralizing. You can't do that. And it, it's interesting for me because people always ask me like, oh, you know, you're non-Muslim relatives and family, like uh, if they go to Jahannam, like, doesn't that bother you? And I'm like, why would it bother me? In, in so much as I'm not a zealot, you know, those people, I meet some converts, they're very zealous. And they're like, no, I don't care. My family are kufar. They can burn in the fire. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't heard them I've heard do, do that, that, but okay. I've heard them do that. I've oh, really? That. Yeah, yeah. And like, I'm just, I, I cringe. Like very uh, Salafi? Or no? I wasn't going to say that, so, but, you know. Well, I, I took the word out. Less than edged. Less than edged. Um, <laughs> the, we should make t-shirts. Yeah, bless than edged. <laughs> Question mark. <laughs> no, no, bless than edged dot, dot, dot. That's it. Um... No, look, I was saying the, I've met converts like that, but for me, it, it's something a lot, it's a lot more simple than that. And it's a lot less sort of chest beating. And it's the, the very, um, the very clear fact that, that I sort of settled upon after, a month after my shahada, there was sort of no anxiety or doubt because I came to appreciate, and it was a video by Sheikh Hassan Ali, I think in the UK. Hassan Ali is a fast bowler. From yeah, Pakistan. From Pakistan yeah. Is there also that's the name of the Sheikh, chef, right? I think so. I think his name is also Hassan Ali. Yeah, yeah. he's, he's Ali really, as well. I think. Yeah, he's awesome, bro. I really like him. Yeah, he's a, he's a really 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 cool Sheikh, mashallah. Um, and his videos helped me a lot. Uh, he taught like I learned a lot from his videos when I was a uh, earlier Muslim back in my Muslim infancy, and so I've turned four now or five. So you know I'm not a I'm not a baby anymore. I'm five in Muslim years. So the, the Sheikh Hassan Ali video was talking about Allah's justice and it's like you have the equation and you're reading it wrong. So when it comes to justice, we're saying two plus two equals four, right? That's, that's in a simple equation. We don't have the two, so we're going two plus blank equals four or two plus blank equals blank and you can't fill in those gaps. But the only answer we do have is that Allah is just. So the rest of the equation before the equals, when we know that the end goal is that Allah is just, everything else before that, everything that gets added together is ghaib. Like you can't know it. It's yeah. in the ghaib. And so why would we try to spend our lives agitated and deciphering that when we can rest comfortably in the understanding that Allah is just? Yeah. So obviously when people ask me that now, I just say, look, Allah is just. Whatever, whatever anyone has earned, that is what they get. MashaAllah, well said. And just to um, add as well, to what you were saying, we know from the Sira, we know um situation with Rasulullah's uncle, Abu Lahab. And I know there's ikhtilaf. I know people say it's like a minority, but they'll say, you know, Abu Lahab died as a Muslim. Um, some like I think was it Brelvis and some Abu like, Lahab. And yeah, and and some some oh Shias as well, because it's like, why would um basically you know someone that's related to Ali Radian who you know died? You mean Abu Talib? 
Oh, sorry, Abu Talib. Yeah, I, I, said like, Abu I was like, I said Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was one <laughs> yeah, of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's one of the evil, the yeah. only people who you can. Well, say. what's interesting, you know, people uh, may not know this. Abu Lahab gave protection to Rasul some after Abu Talib's um death, but not from the perspective of like it's love more, and yeah. is it. It's more so just like he's now like you know important position, mm. and it's like you know family looks after you know family, and that's what Abu Talib it's did. Clan, clan, yeah, loyalty, clan. Yeah. It was more like clan loyalty rather than actually like love and, and protecting him in that sense. But um, I don't know why I'm going to that. Just to show that some people think, oh, is, does he know he's a Sira? Because <laughs> mm. he mixed up Abu Lahab with Abu Talib. But yeah, so Abu Talib, we know. Um, yeah, as I said, Brelvi, like I think some Brelvis and some like Sufis as well. I think your Sheikh Hamza Yusuf also thinks Took he died. Opinion. Also. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think that's like, that's not like a majority opinion. Majority, no, majority no opi- it's not. Majority it's not opinion the opinion is, that I was taught yeah. and that I take. Yeah. So a majority opinion is that he died, um, you know, non-Muslim but what was interesting is that he saw too many signs but you know essentially fell onto the fact of like you know his, his tribal loyalty mm. and you know not going against his you know forefathers etc but this is just like a personal um, opinion like take it with a grain of salt but I think there's a wisdom as to why that example is in the seerah obviously from the perspective of Rasulullah Sassam, you know Abu Talib gave him protection right and that's really important and helped him you know sort of uh, maneuver the situation in you know early days of Islam and you know, all that. But from the perspective of giving an example to the rest of the world and the Ummah post, um, you know, the 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 life of Rasulullah SAW, as an example that it's almost like an example where Islam will spread so far and wide that there'll be situations where people will convert to Islam and the whole family's not Muslim. How do they make sense of this? Mm. And I think that is a brilliant example that we know Rasulullah SAW had so much love for Abu Talib, mm. so much love to the point where like, on the deathbed, he's um, it's like you know, give a shahada, and I can argue with Allah on the day of judgment. Mm. Like that's like a huge thing that shows like how much love. Yeah, absolutely. And he was about to say it, but then the other, uh, I think Abu Jahal, like tried to convince. Like, Are you going to go against your forefathers? And he sort of you know retracted or didn't say the um, the shahada in that sense, and he passed away. So like that is actually an example. And then we know uh, Abu Talib, and one of the precursors to basically the um, you know the night journey is because um, the 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 year of sorrow was when Abu Talib died and yeah, Khalid Jalalan huh? uh, died. And so that was like a big, big, you know, emotional, you know, factor and loss for Rasulullah Sallallahu And he actually said, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu like, I'll actually argue with Allah. Like I have something to say mm. on your behalf if you at least just say the Shahada. Mm. And then I think I might get the details mixed up, but I think Allah sort of said, um, I think in the Quran somewhere where it's like, um, this is not befitting like in that sense and I mean mm. something to that effect but point is is like that is an example in terms of you can have that love that deep emotional connection even though you're a Muslim with another non-Muslim mm. especially in this context was the family by in saying that you're allowed to have that that's normal and it's like how do you navigate that? I think there's a perfect that's a perfect example um, of how you can go about it mm. um, you can acknowledge people's um, who are non-Muslim like their um you know, hospi- uh, hospitality and their generosity. And we, there's so many examples in the Sira about this. Well, as a man, you can marry a non-Muslim yeah. as long as they're Jew or like Christian. That, that Like the most intimate relationship that you can probably have with another yeah. human and you can share it with another. But I think it's just like something comforting to see as that example of people like, I, you know, mm-hmm. especially someone like yourself, right? Like that's something to yeah, look absolutely. into and, and um, understand because it's like how you're feeling. Rasul Sassam would have obviously felt it as well in the, yeah. um, you know making sense of the, you know these family and people that are dear to him not his enemies his like allies like Abu Talib was on, in the boycott when um, the Muslims had to leave Mecca mm. right and the Quraysh basically did not allow them to you know marry into the people and give them food and do trade or anything so that to resort to like the outskirts and lived in poverty for like I think it was like two three years right Abu Talib was with them in that mm. so it's like this is someone that's done so much for Islam in that sense. Absolutely. And then when I see some people who are in the, in, especially in the sort of culture wars and the political spaces now, who genuinely stick up for Muslims and people will be like, yeah, well, that person's a kafir who supports this and this and this. Or yeah, like maybe that person supported the Muslims in this context, but, you know, they they hold these views yeah. as well. We're talking about like I, a kafir. And then I always think of them, I'm like, this is a uh, you're touching on an amazing point. This is these are people that are Abu Talib's, right? Like 
just because they're not Muslim doesn't mean they can't actually be, and they might be, they might be very wrong. They might be very misguided. Uh, not not merely by the fact of their kufr, but like in the way that they might be helping. But their sincerity and their genuine care for Islam is something that we can respect and we can value. Agree. And anyone who's like, oh yeah, you know, you're just like a oh, little Western suck up because you know you you support all these. All these people like uh, the kafirs and, and you said this kafir is good But they're kafir, they're dirty and they're scum <laughs> And you're dirty and you're scum And you should feel ashamed of yourself People who speak like that It's like alright Well how, how are you going to talk about Abu, Abu Talib then? Go on Go on then bruv like, And even um, we have Muti ibn Adi um, Who gave protection to Rasulullah This was right after the boycott Where he actually sent his sons And um, allowed Protection for him when no one else gave Rasulullah some protection, which is like a big deal in that context, because Mutim Ibn Adi had to stand ag- uh, against, so stand up and against the other tribal leaders like Abu Jahl in terms of you know continuing the boycott, and he was you know there to to protect Rasulullah some in that sense. Mm. They will obviously go back to their own tribal custom because this is a proof of of a falsehood in the sense that if someone like for example an enemy, um, right, they have to um, go against their own tribal customs in order to they hate their enemy so much that they'll actually mm. you know go against and contradict their own principles and tribal principles that they've lived with or you know in order to they hate their enemy so much they want to kill them right which is unheard of in the in the time of um the arabian peninsula at that time it's like you protect your family you protect your chieftains you're honest and you don't mm. ever kill um someone from your own clan like all this like stuff but then for some reason when islam started spreading these Went against of every single rule whatsoever. So Mutim bin Adi in that context was like um, monumentous because obviously protected Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what's interesting in the Battle of Badr, like post Battle of Badr, when um, the captives um, were freed, mm. um, uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, um, "If Mutim bin Adi requested for the captives to be free, I'd free them for his sake." Right? That's like a big statement. Mm. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi the Messenger of Allah. Um, said for a kafir like that's a mm. huge deal right and so like for him in that context however from Mutim bin Adi's perspective right he was going from the perspective of this is not what our principles and tribal customs are mm. we don't kill our or you know sanction or boycott our own family members right so he he was going back to his own tribal custom but it's not like Rasul Sam said no because you're only following yeah, your yeah. customs it's more like so this is this is the intersection of power, reading power in our context of, you know, um, in this current day and age, people, mm. you know, get freaked out when it comes to these conversations and also understanding in that context of, you know, understanding through the Sira and what's going on in the Sira. Look, I'm not going to say this is why, but this is the, uh, one of the, I guess, rationales I'm seeing, I'm trying to make sense of is that Rasulullah Sallallahu utilized um, moments, situations, people's, for the cause of Islam, it's not like he fool went and dig, dug deep into their intentions, right? Um, I'm talking from the perspective, like mm-hmm. this specific context of Mutim bin Adi, um, like, oh, but you're following your own custom and um, tribal laws, and that's cool for so I'm not gonna take protection or something, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's it's more to it, right? And he saw power where it is, protection in that in that context, he utilized it to his you know advantage, and that's how it. When about like we know like Najashi for example even before like he became Muslim you know he you could maybe make the argument that Rasul some knew he was going to convert so that's why he sent the Muslims there mm. but there's the other obviously reading that this power right he had protection we go to him we utilize him we knew he was a just king we use that so like it's kind of um, going back into your sort of not that those people were evil but it's kind of similar boat in terms of how you articulate like you know Islam spreading through evil people in that sense not in that sense but adds on to that like it can happen and we utilize means in that sense right um as long as it doesn't clearly contradict our principles of islam um specifically so but what's really interesting mutin with adi's son jubair bin mutin eventually converted to islam as well which is another interesting thing so like there's there's these things that we there's so much to unpack in this era and sort of reading it um i had so much other stuff I kind of forgot but i don't know if you had anything to add to that but it's basically the conversation about you don't know, non-Muslims and how we interact mm. and what role do they play in our even talking about our current context poli- politically or otherwise and how we should go about it because there is that extreme though um, and I've seen that it's like whatever the non-Muslims do say and think it's like we have to cater towards that but mm. then there's the other extreme where it's like 
or um, yeah i've seen muslims support like, like lgbt mm-hmm. stuff um and like and sort of the that lack of critical thinking and discernment when it came to uh, the consequences and 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 the genuine sort of divine mandate and divine command yeah. when it comes to things when you sort of forsake that and you can d- certainly see that conflation and i absolutely understand why some people on the on the right hand side of the culture wars get aggravated and and irritated by those kinds of uh, those kinds of individuals but in that aggravation and irritation they go into the extreme that we mentioned yeah they go into the extreme of basically uh throwing all the babies out with all the bathwater um and now there's just like a little pit of babies and bathwater on the floor in the corner over there and islam is completely lost in all of it do you know what i yeah. mean the the points that we mentioned about justice about morality about iman and kufr and the complexities of it in 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 the in the political circumstances that one may face um and in the material circumstances that one may face particularly the complexities of it are thrown out completely yeah and it's just blind like they've grabbing the babies by the ankle and chucking them out with the bathwater you know <laughs> and that's unfortunate and it's all because of their anger and furor uh, with fury with these individuals who do the other extreme and that's pretty much how i just see the culture wars in a way like um there's there's one extremity another extremity and and the vice not the vices the excess of one group say the left uh because we we don't have to be sort of euphemistic about the way we describe things the excess of the left in their uh pandering to certain immoral things uh that the kufar do because they think that you know oh well these good left wing kufar helped us and um they're nice so maybe we should help them too in their pursuit of um the 17th gender like obviously that's a complex conversation but there there are extremes there and because people who are who are more on the right or have certainly aligned themselves more on the right cuz there's a sort of subconscious political conditioning that occurs for muslims uh some muslims are just naturally whether it's their temperament and i think a lot of the time it is or their context they just associate themselves more with the western right and others because of their temperament or their context associate themselves more with the western left and when you see that the the way that the left the extreme left and and the muslims on the left behave with regards to those things then it 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 evokes a very deep emotional response from the right and and thus in those discussions and in those very sort of heated like pits of of debauched demagoguery you see this uh you see this absolute neglect of these very important hadith and points and principles and lessons from our history and that's exactly you mentioned that yourself how the story of abu talib is there for a reason you yeah. know it's not merely perhaps about the free will of one individual it, it could be there like these these events and these occurrences uh were designed by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a guidance for the ummah in later generations and we just neglect that because of our own sort of emotional responses to to stimuli and and discourse that that you know evokes and and provokes our sensibilities exactly yeah and however in that's in, in in terms of adding to into to caveat uh, what we're saying it's also um important to um Uh, obviously you've, you've talked about it like importance of like when you talked about morality like sticking to the islamic principles at the end yeah. of the day like for example you see so many times like you know there's like a famous example uh pretty much pre battle of badr like um before like the sahaba sort of knew it was, was going to end up being a huge battle they were just trying to raid a caravan a lot mm. of goods and spices and money um and there was one like disbeliever that kind of came along wanted to hop in and mm. and he was like you know can i join and rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said like do you testify you know la ilaha illa muhammad mm. rasulullah and he said no and he asked uh and he left the guy came back again and he said uh, same question he said no he left then he came back <laughs> rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked same question he said yeah um and he joined the army so like it's very important in that you know it's to, you know we have to stick by the islamic principles in that sense like even many tribes that rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
um, negotiated with, um, you know, in terms of, you know, making alliances and, you know, coming under the fold of Islam. A lot of the chieftains, it's always just purely political in the sense that it's like, you know, if you pass away, like, will I take over, right? And, you know, it's like, no. Um, not no, it's like Allah uh, chooses this, um, whoever to lead. Um, so, like, you'll see those examples of, you know, sticking by our Islamic principles and making sure we mm. go about it in that sense, right? But when it comes to, like, um, allyship, and if it benefits the Muslims, mm. um, even if it's from a non, uh, non-Muslim, non you have to consider and take take it on board. And we see how many instances how, you know, non-Muslims interacted with uh, Rasulullah some in that context. And it's just like, you know, it will surprise a lot of people, to be honest, mm. um, genuinely. There's different there's different responses to this um, based on where you sort of stand in the in the Muslim culture wars. There's like the 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 zealot camp, which are like you know completely averse to the idea of interacting with non-Muslims, and then they need to see it. They need to hear these stories and be exposed to them to under to, to develop their understanding of the true Islamic guidance for politics, right? Yeah. And then on top of that. I think the, the more complex, convoluted um, sort of area of the discussion, the layer of the discussion, is the fact that Muslims disagree over who's actually helping the deen. Mm. The great love of, of, um, of the Abu Talib of our time, Jordan Peterson, for example. <laughs> you know, he's not a Muslim, he's but oh man, he does, jet, yeah, he does like so it. much. Like he's, he's refuted the, the, the feminists and the... I don't even know who yeah, are the exactly. feminists and the leftists. Same enemy. Because anyone who watched that Zizek debate knows how bad Jordan Peterson demolished Zizek, right? Honolulu, yeah. Yeah, bro. Zizek had, had no idea what hit him. Um, so, yeah, the, the idea of Jordan Peterson, the Abu Talib of our time, having these discussions and, and you know, being something of a, a non-Muslim paragon. And... Then you have like the left wing Muslims who hold up um, individuals on the left. I don't know. Can you think of any examples of of figures enamored by the by the Muslim left that are non Muslim? Uh, there there must be heaps. Like man. what? Uh, living? I yeah, Edward li- Said comes to mind. Yeah, Edward Said to some extent. Although he's not even. I think he's a lot less controversial. I'm thinking more in terms of like left wing politicians. Um, and left wing, left wing sort of uh, allies of Islam. I don't think that the culture of, like, sort of left Edward side is like Abu Talib, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, you know who genuine. is, bro. Um, <laughs> what's his name? Is it Wael Halak? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's legit. Bro. He's proper legit. Like. Muslims sitting at his feet, being like, "Tell me more about Sharia." <laughs> what the hell, man? That's cool. He has to be a secret Muslim, bro. I don't yeah, understand man. how he's able to articulate in that manner. That's it. Um, and then it's like, he's no, just like, no, I'm not Muslim. Yeah, but I'm not Muslim. Bro, when I found out well, Halak was, on the when I found out well, Halak was a Muslim, yeah, I, was I was like, confused. I was like, nah. That, bro. <laughs> nah. 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 <laughs> uh, that's it. I, I reject this. This is nonsense. I saw a tweet the other day. It's like, um, if there's one non Muslim to speak on behalf of a Muslim, it's Wal Halak. Mm. So I, I agree. Yeah, man, he's like uh he's like the guy the the one the one white guy who's allowed to hang out with like the um you know the one token like he's like oh it's okay he's 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 accepted now he's a token token dude I've so seen it before. About yourself? Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> the one white guy hanging out I'd be like oh wait how can I talk shit about white people when when there's this white guy here. And then the other brown people in the group. That's how will I feel like, sometimes. The other brown people in the group be like, oh, okay, nah, he's not like that. Like, I actually he's, feel he's like tokenistic. That, I feel like you were speaking my mind there. I was actually thinking about like the one white like guy in American schools who hangs out with the with the African American kids. That was uh, that was I, what I was thinking. Um, you know the Snapchat Imam, uh, Imam Sahib Web. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I, saw, I saw a photo once. Like, I think he was a lot younger, like a lot of African American. He's like hanging out with them and stuff. So he's. I don't know why that came to my no no that's but, that's certainly very yeah. pertinent. Wait, so I actually had a thought. I find that's like a sanguine thing, right? Mm. I find like sanguines can only do that. You mean like hang out with different crews? Yeah, 
Maybe I I don't know I never it's really interesting that you no, no, you see you a lot that. of like for example some like you know you just mentioned token white people able to you know fit in with um mm. most you know different communities I find it's always the same one usually just the social where everyone likes them and they just yeah come join us and yeah I think that maybe it's I uh, think that happens with you bro like I see you chilling with the Bengali crew I'm like how how's how's he more in the Bengali circles than me and I'm Bengali so I'm I get confused. Then I make sense of the temper. I'm like, oh yeah, fair enough. It's really interesting because I'm actually, it, it looks like I'm just sort of going with the flow, but I'm actually very strategic, right? I'm actually quite thought out and planned. Oh, wow, you're cunning. I have, huh? I have like a clear path. So <laughs> clear path. I can't be too, I can't try too hard. No one likes, it. no one would accept yeah, the guy yeah. who tries too hard, you know? It's or too much? Yeah, like, like does too much. Like I think people sense that from like a mile away. Eh? Yeah, yeah, you can sell that. And people people get deterred very quickly from that guy. I, I notice too, when someone tries too hard to to fit into a crowd, it can come off really cringe, yeah. as you know. So like I can't try too hard. But then I also can't not do enough. Yeah. I have to do enough thinking and working towards being culturally sort of aware and sensitive and to, you know, cater to the sensibilities of that group i.e bengalis or whoever and to like really pick up on the experiences quickly so i can be relatable or i can relate and in that sense um you kind of have to tread that very fine line and not many people can do that so i'm gonna pat myself on the back yeah. right here boys if you want to take a break from the podcast you should write a clap me for white people yeah how to, how, tread, how the to tread the bro this now this conversation now in and of itself I think you're like case study, bro. Is um, you should, you should is cringe though because ground. people be like, this guy thinking about it so much. Why is he thinking about it so much? <laughs> you know, now I'm like, why am I thinking about it so much? It's um, it's that's what I mean. I'm now I'm upsetting that fine line where it's like I'm thinking too much about it. But yeah, if if someone wants to make friends with or like fit into a certain crew, like I reckon it would apply if you come from a different country as well. Like if you move from overseas uh, to especially from like a non-Western country to a Western country or vice versa, or you move from like America to Australia where people's attitudes are completely different and, and the sort of ethos of the people is fundamentally like the opposite in many ways, right? Americans are so different, bro. Americans are like cartoon characters. I don't even think they're real um, half of the time. I'm like, bro, I can't believe you guys really sound like that. But the point is, it's if anyone was to think about how, how to do that, I think it really comes down to just like thinking about how people communicate in that context. So like if I said, uh, for example, I moved to America and people are culturally different and they don't get my way of speaking, which is kind of like distinct to the area, right? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of like area-isms and things like that. I couldn't necessarily use that way of speaking or be that same uh, or present my thoughts the same way as I could in the area. Obviously you have to sort of code switch to some extent, but it's not about changing yourself. It's more about thinking about how other people speak and thinking about how to connect with them. Yeah. If that makes sense, as opposed to uh, sort of thinking about the culture in, in general. Although I think that honestly, like if, um, if someone has a interests and passions, personality, then it's it's never going to be that hard to find a group of people to hang out with or to fit in with. But one of the things my um my experience, I guess, of of sort of hanging around with diverse groups of people is like you also can't take yourself too seriously in a sense. Like you just have to you have to understand that, like as a white guy, especially you're gonna you're gonna you're going to have to, again, not try too hard to push back at like the white jokes. Yeah. Like if someone makes white jokes, be like, no, <laughs> our food does have flavor. <laughs> yeah. I've had that actually. Someone said, like someone argued me on. You can't do that, bro. Like that's not cool either. But then at the same time, you can't be like, um, yeah, <laughs> white people. You know, yeah. like every time there's a white joke. Yeah, that's right. I hate them too. Yeah. I hate myself. Like that's, that's cringe. So again, it's a fine line and you just have to sort of find that. What do you um, just stay quiet? Do you nod know along? Do yeah. Either if, 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 if there's nothing for you to say, team? if someone starts roasting me about being white, like most of the time it doesn't work, right? Because people try to fit like their, their Eastern suburbs, nerdy, um, like Greg, Greg Smith, white guy kind of vibe. 
to a wog from the area. Yeah. It's like, I can still be white, right? But I'm a wog from the area. So it's like, how does that work at all? You know, my family speak like this. So like, that's not, that's not how the, so the white jokes don't even apply to me a lot of the time. Not again, not saying that I'm not white, but like the classical jokes, you know? And then, um, yeah, because the Italians were on the brunt of it as well. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a topic I don't go to either. Yeah. You can't be like, you, you know, I, I no, feel, but I'm okay. But yeah, specific yeah. context wise, like Sydney context as well. Yeah, yeah Western rough. Sydney ethnics are sort of bundled together in a way. But another point is that when you say like, oh, you're hanging out with the Bengali crew. Yeah, they're Bengali crew, but by and large, they're not like they're born here. And that's why everyone says to me, they're like, oh yeah, you and your wife come from different cultures. I'm like, bro, we grew up three kilometers away from each other. <laughs> Every minute of her life was spent within a three kilometer radius of mine. So like, how, how are we that culturally different? Is that knocking on our door? No, it's not. Okay, sorry. Listening to your earphones, I can't tell where the knocking's coming from. But are you subtly making a, um, a uh, argument for um, uh, traveling home by um, Sheikh Abdul Haki Murad? Or a Western Islam. I, I don't context. know if is you this, guys, is this, if you guys this um, a way to. We're going to pick point? up on it, but basically, this whole last like 15 minute spiel of mine has all just been about traveling home. <laughs> Why is that guy knocking? I think he okay, really wants to join a conversation. Maybe he really enjoyed it. Is is that, right? Should yeah. we check? Yeah, go check. I will talk in the meantime to myself. But um, yeah, I think it's really important. I think it's really important. Sorry, guys, for that random pause. Was he a nice guy? Was he a white guy? The guy. Huh? Oh, okay. That's awkward. What if he heard? Oh, okay. I'm through for room. Oh, yeah, true. This is high quality studio, bro. But yeah, so. Oh, well, we, I don't know how we went into that conversation from. Um, we were talking about, you, um, talking about, so, you know, our whole duration of the podcast, it went from, uh, disbelievers. Yeah. They're going to, disbelievers will go hell. So why should you be concerned? It's none of your control. And then we shifted to, but Hey, believers can help Islam. So be nice to them. This, that. Mm. So yeah, I don't know. Then now we went to no, like we how, talked, how we talked, struggle it is for white people. We to talked about morality. Into, we talked about morality, and I think it all actually blends together because we were talking, spending most of the time talking about how people who are non-Muslim fit in with Muslims, Abu Talib. Yeah. Um, for example, and then how there's like evil people, or wicked people, who are amongst the Muslims, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has has made it thus, or intended it thus, and we sort of segued then into sort of social awareness and, and having that ability because you mentioned that um, when it comes to hanging out with groups of people, because I was talking about how, yeah, cultural sensitivities and things like that are important, but trying too hard is not too important. I talk about cultural sensitivity, there's a bit sad as well from um, zero perspective, right? Like I think a lot of people don't realize that it's not like Rasul or someone was straight away like, this is the, uh, I don't know, like when it comes to international relations or diplomatic, you know, mm. sort of ties, it's like, oh, this is a kufar, we've got our own ways. Mm. Uh, we shouldn't follow it. Like, for example, um, s- uh, stamping your own signature and when it comes to writing a letter to someone, like it's got to be stamped and sealed mm. with wax. It's a very like specific thing at that time and Rasul Islam wasn't like, that's the way of the kufar or something. Oh yeah, you people who, I mean? who who like... like there, there was like an example, like, oh, kufar, is this yeah. how people do it now? Okay, cool, we'll, we'll do mm. it in that manner. and Because that, that's what was the situation then so there's a fine balance between like you know you can uh, you know acclimatize to you know sort of you know rules and i always wanted to draw ways. that analogy between like the age of empires and the age of the westphalian nation state and and the democratic system and the reason what i mean by that is like does the ideal muslim state now i mean i'm asking this as an open-ended question i generally am not like trying to put out an idea here but i want someone inshallah maybe who listens or like you yourself to answer this if islam came about in an age of empires yeah right I would if islam came about in an age of empires and and that was how the world worked it was it was a time of conquest expansion through conquest and 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 the like the commodity of the time was uh militaristic expansion that's how you survived and if you, you conquer or be conquered I think this question has been made before, but in a, in a nation state, a world of nation states, and maybe this is where like Hizbut Tahrir 
maybe sort of fell off a bit where they had this idea that no, there had to be a, a empire, like there has to be a Muslim empire. But maybe empire was just the sort of unit, the state unit of the time. And now in the Westphalian, sort of post-Westphalian nation state and, the, and, and uh, its equivalent like around the world, that is the unit of today. And so yeah. the Muslim, polit- like the Muslim uh, political structure must naturally mold itself to being within that system. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. And I think that's a lot, that's a big conversation as well. Like basically like Imran Khan is our caliph, caliph of today. Yeah, like and maybe the caliph has just, to be the, just the most powerful Muslim leader in the world has to just declare himself a caliph. Exactly. Because that's what happened in the past. There was always like more than one khilafah. Obviously there was one khilafah that was more recognized than others. And that was the khilafah that was the most powerful state. But I reckon if the president of Turkey took the title of caliph at the same time, who could who could say anything about that? But the issue is is like within um you know the laws and regulations, um secular laws. Yeah, yeah. but there were secular laws, I guess, in the past as well. Yeah, that's the other counterpoint. That's another question. It's like yeah. we took on Byzantine law during the time of expansion. Um, you know, we took from you know the that time as well. I so guess I guess the, the there's a difference though. Like there is a genuine difference in so much as the the uh, the the system that was at least given lip service. Although ultimately it was at the behest of the Sultan or the Caliph, um, especially under the Umayyads. If the Umayyads wanted to do something, they they would do it regardless of Islamic, um, regardless of Sharia a lot of the time, the the later Umayyads especially. But there was still an understanding that the state was meant to be governed according to Sharia, Mm. whereas now that's not the case. Do you know what I mean? But with the case of like the Taliban... That's not true. Like they, they, they do believe that the state has to be governed according to Sharia and they are a nation state. They're not starting to like, you know, regather their army so they can march into Uzbekistan and, <laughs> and reform like this giant Islamic policy. Like they're not, they understand the nation state. So maybe the best we can do is sort of settle for, um, and isn't that but post sites, Pycott agreement, that's the issue in terms of like, what happened was a reaction to, you know, the fall of the Ottoman Empire. So it's mm. like when there was like a Muslim polity and you have, you know, nation states like... Breaking down the you're breaking down nation these, state borders, yeah, that were invented by the British and their pencil. And yeah, why would you adhere to that? To that? Yeah, I think that that's true. And I think we maybe need to think... But this is... The, bro, this is... Everything's so messed up, man. Like Iraq is standing there being like, aha, I'm an Iraqi. And then... Across the border, 20 kilometers away, the guy's like, aha, I'm a Syrian. Like, I'm a Syrian yeah. person. And it's like, bro, they're, they're manufactured identities. But then, so this argument, right? Can't you say the same during the time of Rasul or something like Asham or like, you know, the lands, why no. they're called, or Hind, why no. they're called Hind? Not at all, bro. Come on, that's completely different. I'm, I'm just proposing. It's completely, bro. You're talking about cultural barriers and geographical barriers. I'm talking about like arbitrary borders and how nationalism has like, Group together these but that national of the board. time would be like tribes right tribes is, a, is the only equivalent and tribes were a serious thing yeah um to the point where even rasul some said like you know th- marrying according to like tribal you know mm. um high you know status it's like fine you know it's not like Ram yeah but you still have tribes by the way now like like yeah, Arabs yeah. have tribes um but then you add nation state on top of that and it's of like course, you know, you know, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to just yeah, yeah, yeah. no, but now you have like another <laughs> layer of just like meaningless. No, but how about garbage? Right, so there's a other to take into consideration. I don't know, I'm knocking so much, but take into consideration. I think I've seen, and it's really frustrating. Like as a Bengali, he's seen um, Pakistanis. Obviously, it's wrong. They make the argument of Bengalis mm. um, gaining independence because of culture and you know breaking away from the Ummah, all that sort mm. of argumentation. But there are some nations that are nation state you know but they founded their own independence as a reaction to um certain atrocities that there were yeah um so absolutely. there's obviously exceptions to when Bangladesh is like a big one in that sense that it you know able to stand its own two feet in that sense and gain independence because it was being we know like the exploitation in terms of um resources yeah and, do you think that it was the like do you so like that, that reaction and bloodshed obviously i have a question like for you in this but i'm saying that yeah no but i have a question genuinely like that relates to what you just mentioned do you think it was a language thing alone 
And do you think that if if it were just the language issue that Bangladesh would have become independent? Really? But there, there was uh, not the only issue of this, but it was one of the many. No, but, but if, if because everything it was, else was being was, imposed, yeah, but if everything else language. was fair, what do you mean? Like there was, was a, a better distribution between east and west, greater parity between east and west. Um, the actual like the the east the west Pakistanis were genuinely invested in the um in the protection and the incorporation of the Bengalis into the union. Do you think that the language thing alone would have been enough to break it down? A good question. What do you think? I I, I can't say. I have to ask you. The issues is like that. The core of it would always go back to like how the British went about, you know, breaking up India, Pakistan, because to call Bangladesh West Pakistan and cooperate with ba- uh, Pakistan was mm. like a big mistake in of itself mm. because totally different climates, totally different people, totally mm. different languages. And you try- but in, in a way, that's the same in, in Pakistan now. Like a Kashmiri is completely different from yeah, this a Yeah, there's diversity within Indi- India, Pakistan. Yeah, they're the both like, they're not like ethno states. Like Bangladesh is an ethno state. Isn't it like it's the nation of Bengalis? I don't think there are many other ethnic groups there, except for maybe in the Chiragong side, like the the hill people. So yeah, no, like that's it. It's an ethno state. Whereas like there are nations like Pakistan that are made up of many states. So like the question that goes back to is still like, could Bangladesh have just been like another language or another cultural group within the greater sphere of Pakistan, or do you think that they the Bengali people were so attached to their their cultural identity and their language that they wouldn't have ever compromised any of it. There was deep racism. Um, that was always going to be um, a big mm. factor. And something to consider, I can talk about like race analysis in, in that sense, in terms of how it shaped um, the situation, especially like, um, for example, when it comes to like Islamophobia and like even when, you, when we talk about Edward Said and his contributions as well. Uh, I guess I'm on a very simplistic level. Like he was a revolutionary because I think at that time or um, before him, it was more about the argument that um, the British colonized and and then these sort of opinions and thoughts about the East mm. um, emerged. Emerged. Whereas yeah, he flipped yeah. it around, right? Like the reason why you know colonization occurred and the British went into and conquered and didn't care about culture and the people for what they are is because they had those racist sentiments or yeah. perceptions and ideas in their head. Um, that drove them to do that. And I think there's a lot of um, truth to that, especially in the kind of outcome of like um, how Pakistan and mm. Bangladesh, um, you know, formed. And because... Playing and into that. And I told you, I have like yeah. evidence from my own family because I, I told you about this. My dad, um, basically, um, my great um, my grandfather was like, um, worked in embassies. So like my dad, a young age, um, sort of went around in different places around the world. Um, and so he actually lived in Pakistan. For, like, he did some schooling when he was a kid, like I think three or four years. And this was, um, he was a young kid. Then he was, my dad would tell me like, he was already suffering racism. And this was before 1971. This was before yeah. the whole war and the situation and independence and the war um, broke out. He was already enduring that at that time, right? And so that's something to like consider and, and um, you know, in that context, how much of like racism played out and then formed and, you know, contributed immensely to what panned out on a political sphere as well. Absolutely. And it, I mean, I think that those prejudices had a huge impact on, on the course of the war and, and whether. And we know in our context, like Western powers going into different exactly, countries. Exactly. It happens. It doesn't like, like justified what, through media. Muslims are, and, and that's the kind of myopia of, of the Pakistani nationalists when they come to discuss um, the Bangladesh situation, how like they completely fail to understand the excesses and the oppression that they committed. They're like, well, why'd you break away from the Ummah? Imagine yeah. I like just started beating you up right now and I'm like, why'd you stop being my friend? <laughs> just forget like, but yeah, but it was just one thing. Like, come on, like uh, I couldn't help it. Yeah. But why'd you stop being my friend? It's like, it's like, what? <laughs> anyway. You know, you want to wrap up? Well, I think we should um, pray more group, yeah. Oh, yeah, so uh, I think, alhamdulillah, it was a blessed podcast because I don't think we've ever recorded after us so or before my group. On a Friday. On a Friday, yeah. subhanAllah. So, inshallah, there's a lot of blessings in this. But, Imagine uh, it's... Oh, we do right. have time to pray, my group, so we can it, go for like another five minutes. No, no, we right? should, you we should, should wrap up. Subhanallah, yeah. bro, this... 
Do you think? Time, do you like, think? Um, pulling pulling the weight off. Imagine this is the worst podcast we ever do. And it's like this is the blessing is no, us. That's a test, though. The blessing is us being like permanently kicked out of the podcast scene. It's like that. <laughs> that was the the blessing is for the ummah. <laughs> that they don't have to hear our podcast anymore because this one is so bad that everyone hates it. People start coming to our houses and picketing us and we can't continue the podcast Speaking anymore. Of picketing, it was funny because um, when I was waiting for you to come, um, I was on Twitter and some I just followed a brother and he's... Uh, you granny. followed a brother? Yeah, subhanAllah. I thought you only followed sisters. True. That as well. But in that context... Um, Bro, is, this, is very, this is a blessed afternoon indeed, turns in following a brother. Alhamdulillah. And so... Randomly is like, I thought he was trolling. I don't even know mm. if he was actually listening to our podcast, but he's like, um, cause he, bro, he's look at his, D, I want to obviously share his name, but look at his DP, bro. He looks like a proper official. Like who wouldn't want to follow this guy? I looked at him, I'm like, bro, this is a guy I want to really want to follow. And I nah, him. I don't, I don't. You don't see it? Nah. Bro, that's a nice address. Look what he's wearing. What? And he said, what? What has his dress got to do with anything? His DP is so nice. So I'm so, just like, I'm going to give it a follow. I'd never, I'd never look at someone's Re- DP. And bro, be like, I'm that's like that. Then what do you look for? Like nothing, nothing. I don't follow. Like I, I don't even do. I don't do this. <laughs> don't do I this. just don't do this. Yeah, I'm Anyways, like, so I'm like, if this I know deserves someone. a follow. Yeah, but what and did then, they say? And then uh, he he, I don't know why he. Cro- oh no, he so he cropped my follow th- notification on his Twitter. And he's like, guys, I'm followed by a celebrity. What's right? his name? Oh wait, 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 wait. I don't know if he wants to be on. He maybe right. he does, but I don't. Maybe yeah. I don't maybe can him, I see? Yeah. Can I see the thing? Yeah. So I'm just like I thought it was just a troll thing. I don't know, because like maybe they don't actually listen to us. They like look at our. He saw my bio and it's like follow um you know co-host of Boys in the Cape mm-hmm. podcast. But then, so I quote tweeted that saying, "I'm truly concerned for those who are genuinely who genuinely think I'm a celebrity, <laughs> right?" And then she and then he like comments. uh Bro, I literally heard your voice on my car speakers. You're a celebrity in my I'm like, oh, this guy actually listens. Like, subhanAllah. Yeah. A lot of people I follow don't even listen or know about the podcast. Don't even yeah, 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 yeah. I get hurt every time I, I sense that from someone. Like, it, it's like, it's like um, heartbreak. It's like going through multiple heartbreaks in a single day. <laughs> <laughs> <You're just laughs> like, like a ah. machine, subhanAllah. Yeah, I just get through it. I'm a, I'm a soldier, yeah. You think, um, yeah, it's like, it's like, I do this for recognition, guys. That's it. I don't do it for any other reason. And I'm not getting my recognition, guys. Yeah. That's it. But Otherwise, yeah. you're just another guy. Like, it's yeah, really I don't want to be another. No, guy. but you're just another guy be with a, a podcast. podcast. No, no, no. Yeah. But like, please, oh, bro, bro, understand. You know that how many, everyone like, has a podcast. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah, bro. In Twitter, everyone just like, oh, he's like that guy. For, like, has a pod. No, like, everyone has a podcast. Bro. Yeah, every man under twenty five. It's like the joke, you know. Oh, yeah. it is a meme. It's a uh, meme. It's a meme. They, the memes are funny. And if man, someone actually, sees like, me, they think, oh, he's just a guy. Yeah, yeah. But then you actually, but we're a Muslim. Not only that's, not, a, okay, well, that, that, that's that's that's, that's a big one, bro. You bro. don't want to be a podcast that just talks. There's shit. so many Muslim-oriented podcasts, though. That's no, the thing. Like, Every man and his we're, dog. We're, we're different. We have like big like shiuk. And well, we that. did. We we did. We did have. <laughs> they the all didn't want to come anymore. Now it's just me and Villawood. <laughs> <laughs> but no, my point is like we've had over 100 episodes. We've had like uh, episodes that that gained a lot of traction. Um, most of these like garage podcasts didn't. Garage podcasts. So. Anyone who wants to be like, oh yeah, that's a guy with a podcast. No, we're no, not we don't just guys it. with a yeah. podcast who talk about crypto and being high value men. Okay. <laughs> that is only 20% of what goes down on this podcast. Um, but yeah, like it, it is the meme, but you've actually had like a respected at times, at other at times, times disrespected, I guess. Um, yeah. A lot of disrespect. <laughs> uh, no fault of your own, man. That's the thing. No. Like, People people desire to have a project like this, right? Like boys and the people be like, I reckon there are people who'd be like, oh yeah, um, I wish I had a podcast. I wish I had all that like clout as as much clout because as you, you don't did. Want it. No, but you don't want it. I mean, I I don't have it. You don't. But I'm it. looking at you, and I'm like, why would anyone else desire that? Like you, first of all, you make a mistake on the podcast, or you 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 have a error, like a, an error in judgment. Everyone pans you for days in public. Like they drag you. Bro, through the, and the worst part is like people who never listened just heard about it. Yeah, they, this is one. They thing start bandwagoning. Yeah. They start like posting like statuses and tweets, exactly. and then you know a refutation mode. I'm like, dude, like, have you like heard even two episodes? Nah. Like, why are you on? Like, why do you hate me so much? So I, yeah, it's 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 actually the most um went through a lot of stuff, but definitely up there. Uh, in terms of proper, like, um, it's actually, I'm going depression mode before we wrap up. Yeah, yeah. But the most, like, 
worst um, situations I've encountered because of boys in the cave. Like yeah, no, I believe like it. That's what I mean. lows that you, the depths of like because hell, like, yeah. you know what I mean. Like just such low because of all that. And there's that you know the the infamous pulling down episode. Do you know how much hate? Yeah. Like you know how viral that went. Like Twitter, Facebook, like it was just ridiculous. Yeah, people that I thought were friends. Like going after me online, like you won't discover. You know alone, yeah, you won't bro, discover was, the true face of your friends and who's your real dip, friend bro, until you start a road. podcast. Worst thing was I was on a holiday with my friends that day, mm. and it was just like the worst like days. Like <laughs> yeah, man, one, that, one of the worst days. Like it was just such a low, n- no one to you know. And it's like someone that wanted to like who was my friend for example at that time. Like yeah, I know um, the context and how that episode panned out wasn't the best, and that person was Christian with the yada yada, but it's like. If you're like my friend, you know what our project's about. You know how we speak about different topics. You know, like us, right? So, like to go through that and being like questioned about you as a person and you know how you go about things and this and that. I think a lot of people aren't willing to sort of give that sort of unwholesome done because I did um, explicit, explicitly say like, yeah, we we didn't do our research properly. And that's a mistake of our own. Mm. Um, we actually didn't know the full views of this sort of person, and no, we no. learned from those mistakes, but. But I, I enjoyed so much. Like it was. But that's mental, the thing. Like, like anyone uh, normal. Like if you make a mistake in life, normally, like you, you, or even if I had, for example, my own little backyard podcast that no one listened to, like every other man in the world right now, um, then I made a mistake on that. No one's gonna care. But when you actually have a podcast that people listen to, and a lot of people listen to, then all of a sudden the scrutiny on you gets much hot, like much yeah. more intense. And and you get dragged, bro, and it, it it's, it's really tough it's, to deal with. So it's like, it's not something. You know, it's fame it's is much. a is a burden in a way, like because like have. we 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 so we endured it when we upload the episode, right? And then mm. there was so much like hate and all that. But once we took it down, we got hate from the other camp, like so much hate. So it was like both exactly. sides, bro. It was like insane. People don't realize that they think like if they were on like Camp A, let's just say Camp A, exactly. wanted the episode down. They, you know, they were angry, whatever, and the episode was down. And then they're all cheering. Pipes Je- bro, Campy emerges like a beast, like a phoenix from, mm. you know, like Yu-Gi-Oh. They have like the Exodia, the forbidden one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that beast just comes out of nowhere and just like you have to deal with that, like that camp. Like it was just intense. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> I got, On that note, uh, wait, wait, wait. One thing about the David Hume thing, but yeah, we, we got time. No, no, nah, nah, I got, I got, I got to bounce. You got to bounce. I have to bounce. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can I say this last thing though? No, 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 no. Okay, we'll I'm joking. Of course you can. Okay. Imagine that. Imagine. All right, so I, uh, now I've got to bounce. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have my notes. I found the David Hume thing. Oh yeah, but yeah, I don't. Right. I don't know if uh, I haven't read it properly, so it might be just jumble of words because it's my notes I took in class. But anyways, um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll go along with it and then see if I understand what you said. Let's go. Idea of reductionism in experiences. If our experiences that we have or what we experience are based on our own sense, David Hume says your thinking is informed by a world around you. So if your experiences are informed by senses and your senses aren't reliable, then isn't no. Th- so this is my sorry. This is my thought. David Hume, or you know, as I said, like you know, thinking is informed by a world ar- around you. Sorry, my notes are all over the place. So my thought after his to refute him is like. So if your experiences are informed by senses and your senses aren't reliable, as we know through Ghazali's works. Mm. Um, he he refutes like um in that sense. Yeah, and his sense is unreliable. Then isn't experiences also an illusion? So um, I don't know where I went with it. No, experiences aren't an illusion, but experiences can't tell you truth. That's what it is. Experiences are real. Like, how can what you feel be an illusion? Yeah, but happy. What you think that is that you're feeling is an illusion. Does that make sense? connection to Allah? Yeah, experiences are important. Yeah, that's. But it. I'm we're making that case. Like, there's more to, um. It more to truth and it's through than just your experience, yeah. As well, so, so I, I don't know if that really answered thing, but anyways, so I just wanted to add that in. All right, thank you guys for listening. <laughs> thank you for, for listening once again to um, high value men in the cave. High value men in the yeah, cave. high SMV men in the cave. That's it. Inshallah, <laughs> rebrand. Peace out. Salam. Salam, gentlemen. <laughs>